All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Let's Discuss uh, with Parsons TKO. It's a super exciting episode for us, episode eight, and we're, we have our first featured guest with us today, so I'm super excited, uh, Carolyn Solaris, and we're going to be talking about transformation and change and sort of the whole broad scope of what that can encompass. Um, as always, we post these on our website. We post these on LinkedIn. They're on YouTube. We would love to start hearing from the audience. If you have comments or feedback, I'm sure Carolyn would like to hear too. Just send us, put, put some comments in there after this. Let us know if this helped you at all or put any thoughts in your head that you might want to share with us. We'd be excited to hear that. Um, as always, I'm your host, Tony Kopechny from Parsons TKO, and I am so happy to introduce uh, my LinkedIn buddy. So I met Carolyn uh, via my mother-in-law, uh, who pointed me out to her articles on LinkedIn, and I, I just kept thinking, oh my God, wow, this person thinks right in the space that uh, that I always really enjoy talking about and thinking about too. And it turns out we actually met and then started talking remotely. So, Carolyn. Well, thanks so much for inviting me, Tony. As you know, it's been a really fun opportunity to get to know each other. And the fact that the world is so small that we could connect by LinkedIn, I think is crazy. And probably a lesson for everybody heading into the new year that the value of your network is critical at this point in time. And so, I will keep posting and hopefully you'll keep reading and we can go from there. So let me introduce myself a little bit. So I am the managing partner and founder of my company, Murphy Merton, and I'm really known for three things. So at the organizational level, I help bring big, messy, hairy ideas into tangible, concrete outputs so that the tr strategy really gets translated. At a team level, I'm often called in to help teams that are trying to get a project off the ground or a project that might be stuck for a variety of the reasons I think we're gonna to discuss today as we talk about transformation. And last but certainly not least at the individual level, and I, I've been teasing about this, but I help people feel better about work. I think we're at a very unique point in history and what's happening at work is there are a lot of people feeling the churn and it's not a joke or a coincidence that we're talking about transformation and that's pretty messy and it's scary and it's a lot, very uncertain. And so if I can do anything to help alleviate some of that stress or angst, I do that too. Yes, I mean, that is awesome. Uh, and thank you. How would, how, how would folks find you online? Sure, so a couple of ways, obviously Carolyn Solaris at LinkedIn, and also my website, murphymerton.com. Those are a couple of areas. I'm on Facebook as well, so the usual social media channels. I do love LinkedIn because it's so easy for professionals, I think, to be connecting and something we all need to be doing. I left my own corporate career about a year and a half ago and didn't have any idea of the power of these tools to connect us professionally. And so if I can give that to any of you out there, I think it's a great lesson for all of us. That's awesome. And we'll make sure we'll have all these links uh, in our show notes and everything as well for everybody. So yeah, I mean, yes, right to the heart of it, right? I mean, how to feel better, <laughs> how to feel better about work and, and we're going to dive in here and that's that's definitely one of the things I see all the time too, which is I'm trying to remind folks like you're not in it alone. You, you're going to exactly. need the support, right? And it, it, this stuff's hard. It's not easy. And it's, it's that holistic. It's yeah, your emotions count. This might not be, <laughs> this is going to be uncomfortable. And how do, how do we get there? But maybe we start with unpacking. I mean, transformation is such a big word, even as a company, we started with it, then we walked away from it. And then I got really motivated. I'm like, I'm back at it. Uh, but you know, what do you think when, when you hear that word, like, what is it, what does it really mean? Well, I think it's a great question. And you and I even talked about that early this summer where we were wondering, should we be using the language of transformation? And at the time, I think you shared with me that you weren't. And then when we reconnected in the fall, you said, I think I'm moving back to transformation. And so I think it is a loaded word. And so what I'm saying is, yes, of course, there's things that are transforming really underneath our feet. That's what creates this very strange uncertainty that we find ourselves in is the ground is literally shifting. And uh, that's not actually untrue. We just aren't, don't always perceive it, but we're seeing it from economic sectors, from new businesses coming up in the world. Your clients, I'm sure, on the mission-driven are seeing it in new ways in terms of how funding happens. And so we're all in the middle of transformation. And so I think the important piece of transformation is that it's an outside in and an inside out phenomenon. And that's different from how we've typically thought about change management in the past. So it's interesting that large organizations started to borrow this language that really came out of, you could call it self-help or new age or even evolved spirituality, but why are we calling it transformation as opposed to growth or evolution or something else? So 
So I think the language is fascinating. And it's important to recognize that when something really does transform, the fundamental elements of it change, right? The obvious idea is a butterfly changing from a caterpillar. But that's a pretty traumatic event, which is why it has to incubate for a number of days or weeks in a cocoon, so to speak. And so I think that's where we find ourselves is the language of transformation is it's describing a phenomenon that's happening around us. And the more we embrace and say, yeah, these things are happening and what's my role in it within the organization that I find myself in, the better. Now, a lot of companies do use the language of transformation and sometimes it gets translated incorrectly as sort of superficial process work. And so I'm clear to say, sometimes if you're using the language, you have to also say, hey, the first step of transformation is more mature processes than we have. Because the process work uh, in and of itself is not always transformative. And that's something that used to drive me crazy until I realized you actually have to have some of those foundational mature processes in order to do deeper transformation work. So I think that's the, the healthy tension we find ourselves in. Yeah, I like that part on the process. Maybe we could dive in on that a little bit. Sure. I mean, we, we, we like to use, for me, transformation always felt that uh, when I talk about it in a group, rather than change, it's like you're taking ownership of it. Like exactly. this, this thing is an activity. It is <laughs> happening and you've got to be involved, like, mm-hmm. you know, in it. It can't, because change is, to your point, change happening. And we, could be, we could be overwhelmed by it or we can then try to own it. But, I, you know, in some of our conversations, you've talked about, it's interesting because you've talked about process and kind of what that means and can we get stuck in our old ways of thinking in these processes even if you, and you know what I mean? And then you, if we need that little bit of process to start moving it forward, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about sure. kind of the difference between being stuck in a process or making the process the thing and then actually transforming. Well, I think it's a really great way that you frame that question because you're right that if we just do incremental process improvement, that's not transformative. You're not really foundationally hitting the underlying systems. And the systems perspective is really important. And it's something that on the side, I started studying over the last six or seven years because I was recognizing that sometimes organizations, it was more than them being resistant to change, is all the systems that we've grown up with, especially in a more mature established company or an organization that's mission driven, is the systems grew up organically and formally around the existing business models. And even if you're a non-for-profit or not-for-profit, you still have a business model. And so everything grew up around that to support that. And so it's flawed thinking, I think, my personal opinion is to say, well, this doesn't work, we have to be more mature. Well, no, it actually probably works just fine to support the existing business model. It doesn't work if we wanna do something that's foundationally and fundamentally different. And you have to go into and underneath those embedded systems, whether they're political or formal like our legal systems and our HR systems, And systems are sort of clunky to help catch up. So I think at the individual level, at the team level, and at the leader level, we have to start thinking of, wow, we don't have systems that are ready for this level of change. And so we're going to have to model what the systems will need to look like and sometimes ignore what the systems are doing, kind of pulling us back, sort of crabs in a bucket saying, oh, don't change, don't transform, but we don't really have a choice. It's going to happen with us or to us, and we get to choose. And I'd rather be part of the, the transformation effort. So I think your question around process is great. You will need new processes if you're truly transforming things. But starting at process is often a knee-jerk response that we easily make because we think, okay, now we have to go figure out how this future thing that we haven't built yet, that we haven't fully architected or conceived, now we're going to go figure out first how to process map, how that comes to life. And part of what I say is, oh, take a big step back. Think forward where you want to go, and then you have to build processes, interim processes, to get you to that new spot, as well as new processes once whatever you're building comes to life. So if you're building a new digital platform for your advertising and marketing, that means you actually have to shepherd the work and build some processes that help you build that, and then create processes to help you run it, future state. The mistake I see a lot of teams, especially in that middle layer, they start at the process work, and then they end up in wild goose chases or deep rabbit holes through no fault of their own, but we start mapping things that we don't yet understand. So it's, I mean, you've said this to me before, where it's, 
you, you spend so much time thinking about the process as a process on paper and then you're mm -hmm. not really doing right so it's right. it's it's those activities of doing that actually start to make the change that start to help you push through and you know and tied into that we had two we have two other you know we put together some questions as always these are informal <laughs> but informed discussions but I, right. I'm, I, I'm not even sure which one to go to next i might just go to the disruption one where i yeah I, so parsons tko focuses in the mission driven space i've been working in the in the dc scene for almost 20 years in the mission driven space and what i've always found interesting is nonprofits will take tech terminology right let's be agile or let's but they don't really apply an agile philosophy and then disruption because it sounds cool like so many people talk about we got to disrupt and be this disruptor and i heard this fantastic quote um i think the book is called play bigger i was listening to but they're like disruption is an outcome it's not the strategy like right. your strategy is something different and then if you disrupted that was the out you can't plan to disrupt or you're still sticking in the same models yeah. And just so I'm wondering, you know, within the looking at the current processes, developing new processes and thinking about how you get to that next state, where do you see something like disruption in, in that kind of <laughs> place or how would, how do people adjust to that? And where do you think that balances against the processes that are there versus trying to adjust? Well, I think a, another great question. And I think the whole point of disruption is you have to disrupt yourself. And to me, if you can start there, because you may or may not disrupt. I've been in many projects for the bulk of my career that said, oh, we're going to do something fundamentally different than what our competition is. And that's a great place for a team to start doing visioning work or whatever, but rarely do we build anything that's truly differentiated. So the transformation, I, my preference is to embed it in every step of the work. And so if teams are not used to doing horizontal work, where we have marketing and human resources and multiple technology teams, right? There aren't single technology teams anymore. There's IT and then there's a front end e-commerce team. There might be an infrastructure team or a networking team. In, in the olden days, say like even 10 years ago, those teams looked separate from marketing, right? They looked separate from human resources. And now everything is having much fuzzier lines and that's creating a lot of challenges for teams, especially because we don't, we haven't reorganized we're trying product models. We're doing some other things. Even Agile, I think, is now becoming more like traditional project management and the waterfall than it was ever intended to be because we're trying to formalize some of these things. So the more you can keep yourself nimble, the more you can understand that every piece of this is disrupting and that sometimes there's going to be friction, the better. Uh, so I think you're right that the disruption's happening. And one of the metaphors I like to coach and train in metaphors and storytelling because I have done too many PowerPoint decks that could literally wallpaper my house probably three times over. But the metaphor to use is we're going to see something like a flying car, right? A flying taxi, a flying car, in our, not just in our lifetimes, probably in the next 10 years, right? So this is the level of disruption that's happening around us. Whole sectors are being disrupted. Whole ways of how many, money exchanges hands are being disrupted. It's having an impact in the nonprofit where strangely nonprofit or charitable giving has declined even as our markets have been really good. So everything is fundamentally shifting. And so I think if we just recognize that you're right, disruption isn't a strategy. It's whether it's happening again to us or with us in the organizations we're in. And the more nimble you are right now in whatever work you're leading or doing, the more prepared you'll be in the five or 10 years from now with whatever's happening next. Some of it's really unpredictable, but if you're not at least thinking in the realm of a flying car, you might not be doing work in the realm of a flying car, but we've got to get your head there. So all of us need to be thinking about the fact that these changes are coming and they're coming faster than we've ever seen this type of change before. Yeah, it's interesting. I get, we get questions often now and it's like, I, can you help me even just understand what the possible is? And that, that's, that's been really telling. I didn't really have those kind of discussions before, but it's been in the last year or so. And I like that question because it's, I think it is starting, people slowly starting to grasp that, right? Like, wow, this is bigger than I, than what I'm seeing in front of me. And you had mentioned the integrated workflows of how everything is, you know, you have these silos, but it's all horizontal across it. And when we see that with technology integrations mm -hmm. and then it really manifests itself is that these various pieces of technology that are supposed to integrate but then they're they're budgeted in this department or that department right? that's right 
So we've, we've come up and we've been calling it um, the integrator role is what seems to be missing. And I had a great question in the summer when I was talking to a group about it, and they're like, well, where would that sit? Like, who does it? And I was like, I honestly don't know. I've seen chief marketing officer, chief digital officer, chief technical officer, some group. But then as I thought about it over the year, it's like there almost has to be some kind of leader or person in the organization that doesn't, doesn't have stake in the outcomes for a single department that can then talk to everybody from them and pull those pieces back together, which is, which is interesting. And so, and you had talked to me about, and I love this, you were like, growth isn't this. Right? <laughs> right. Growth, growth is the spiral. So I, I'm wondering, right. you're talking about the flying car, and if we think in terms of five to 10 years out, people ask, I get that, I don't know if you get this, I get this question a lot when I'm talking to groups, like, what's gonna be the next thing in the next five years? I'm like, I don't know. Like, because people talk about a- AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, and I'm like, it's here now. Yeah. It's not five years from now, it's here. You're just not ready to take advantage of it. So when you, I guess, and how do you balance that, your long-term goals as an organization with getting into the quarterly momentum, right? The, those small bits that are gonna take to get to that long place. How do, how do you think about that balancing the two? Well, I, I love the, that you use the word integrator. And I think that something must be in the ethers or the zeitgeist now because that's a word I've also started to use. So I think in, at one point, we probably called them generalists. And then we said, well, generalists aren't very useful. We need specialists. But the truth now is that we need people who can see across and who can bring multiple perspectives into the work. So what we know for sure, and there's data that backs it up, is when we have right, not just diverse teams and diverse thinking, but just when we introduce all of this together into an output, the outcomes are so much better. And so whether we want to talk about it from a diversity and inclusion perspective, that's a, probably a separate conversation. But the more diverse our thinking is in the work that we're leading and the more diverse that we can push into the outcomes where multiple teams have a stake in the plans we're creating, in the process work we're doing. I've done deep process work with people from IT and marketing and the business units, and it works. It's painful. It really is a little painful because we have to get to some common language about what we're creating. So I think the integrator point is really a great one and organizations are starting to feel it. They are probably in the short run going to put project managers in it. And I grew up in the early days as a project manager. I taught project management. I have deep sympathy and affection for project managers, but they're not the integrators. And so integration has to have a strategic component and an architecture component. And so it really goes to what are we building and how do we get there? And that's where a great PM can come in. So how I balance with the work I do with teams, and I think intuitively I did this for a long time. And then when I started to overlay coaching into this approach, I saw how powerful it really was, is take that longer term vision, whether it's three years or five years, and some people advocate even 10, 20 years out, that's really tricky space, but then bring it back to the particular. So I'm a strategist by nature and by training, but I take issue sometimes with the idea of, oh, there's strategy and then there's tactics. Because sometimes there's actual short-term quantum strategy, boots on the ground, things that are actually going to move that strategy forward. And how I do that with the teams I work with is concrete, actionable outputs. So we focus on deliverables instead of activities. What are we going to create together? And there's something magical that happens on focusing on some, building something. And so, Tony, in one of our conversations, you shared with me how a client was so grateful because so many things came to life as a result of something that you helped build. And I'm not surprised because when we build things, that's how you start to build the dynamic and the teamwork. And so the faster I can help a team move to clarity of what is it that we have to create or produce And then who's involved in creating these different things? And then what's the accountability to each other to move through that? The faster everybody starts to work together. Now, on the converse side, when we start to focus on here's the strategy, now team, go figure out how you're going to work together and we can spin for hours or days or weeks or months. We've all been in these meetings where we start to think, okay, what's our process for communicating with each other? What's our process for who's accountable for what? And the truth is, in those early days of building, building something to execute against a strategy we don't know. And so we can spend a lot of time going through 
a racy document where we're talking about who's responsible and who's accountable and who do I consult with. And the truth is we don't know. We have to start pushing it into outputs. The other thing that managing by outputs as opposed to pure siloed account accountability or where we focus on people doing things um, individually is we start to get clarity and much simpler plans. If you have five things that you have to create and then you're working with a team on those five things, they all know what they have to create and then you can start to see how fast things come to life. And I think it's really tempting sometimes to think that people don't know how to do this. We do know how to do it. The, the teams do know how to do it and our executive leaders do know what, how to lead, but it's pulling it together in things that are simple. And so again, I, you know, apologies to people who have worked with me in past lives where I overcomplicated things, but I'm really in the mindset now of how do we make things simple and clear so everybody's clear on where they're going. And to your point on the short term, the best question you can ask a team, especially if you have senior leaders on the team, is what happens over the next 90 days? And often they don't know. And I don't know is a fantastic place to start because it starts to invite curiosity. Okay, well now let's build a plan. Let's shape how we're going to do this. Let's figure out what, where we are today and what do we need to, where do we need to be at the end of 90 days? And most importantly, what will we have created? So again, that's how I balance that future and current state so that we start to move in the direction of, to your point, it's not a straight line, it's a curved line, but at, we know we're always on that curve. Otherwise, we, it's really easy to quickly get off the curve and go something, do something that's not transformative at all. I mean, your point on the 90 days is so crucial. We've been, as a company, looking at different things too and working with clients like OKRs and really finding ways to put teeth against here's the objectives what, and how much can you, and helping a group understand how much you can fit into 90 days practically, right? right? right. And, really make, and it really shows, oh, this is going to take time. You know, the last conversation I was in um, with a prospective client, they were throwing everything on the table. And I was like, you guys understand this is three years worth of work. That's right. Because you're looking across the table at your colleagues like they're going to get it done in the next six months. And we can help facilitate some of that. But this is three years. This, you can't do it as quick as you think. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, if in that sense, it's like my thought for change or doing things, it's always been there's the top down, the executives, right? They're going to say, oh, look we have one year and we have budget to get it all done and you're on the ground trying to make the change doing it. I mean, do you have experience with that too of how you, you meld this to come together in that middle space to actually make something happen? I, I do. And I, I've spent a lot of time in that space and thinking about that problem. And I think that there's a couple of things I want to frame first is the middle layer of companies, right? Those middle managers at, at big com larger companies and larger organizations. But so I would say VP to a senior manager, manager type role. And why it's important to classify that is that it's easy to think that we have the executives and then we have the rest. And it's not really true. We have a middle layer that the function of that middle layer has always been and evolved to support the existing business processes, right? So if, you're, if you are a startup, you tend to be relatively flat. If you're in a turnaround mode, you go flat. But where we get that middle layer is when things become unwieldy and we have to add some layers in order to shepherd the current state. What I think is happening, and again, it's my own experience because I've witnessed this and I talk to a lot of people doing this type of work, is the middle layer is now being asked to do things that are transformative, to lead really messy bodies of horizontal work and to string things together and to integrate. That's not how those roles grew up. So especially if you're talking to somebody who's at a VP or senior director level, that role always existed to protect that vertical. And now they're being asked to do things that are really horizontal and, and organizational level work, but we have to push it somewhere. And it can't always be led by an executive or you'd have a very top heavy organization. So that's one thing that's happening. So how I coach teams is I say, we have to do both, right? Bring the, bring the vision from the smart executive thinkers and there are plenty of them. And I push back on people who say our executives don't get it. And I push back on executives who say the middle layer doesn't get it. The challenge is trickle down transformation doesn't work. We just know that this transformation happens at a system level. So if you're conceiving the transformation at an executive level and it's not flowing through the rest of the organization in actual work with outputs, then you'll stumble in a year or two from now. That's assured. 
because the, it, the idea of doing it as an umbrella that just cascades down, it, things fall apart. So if you can have a team of people or multiple teams of people shepherding work from the middle, and I say instead of a bottoms up approach, it's, an, it's a middle out where the middle is managing up, out, and down to the extent that they need to. And communicating up is crucial because they have to do something to bridge the executive thinking, the strategic thinking, and the direction with what's actually happening. Now let's talk a little bit about what's happening in the middle as well, is sometimes what needs to happen is counterintuitive from that big picture vision. We often start with the big stuff and then everybody gets kind of overwhelmed, we have massive teams and very little gets through. There are a lot of little things that have to happen along the way and this I think was your earlier point is, how do you tell an organization and get them in the mindset that this is a three-year journey and it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be boring, right? There's a lot of tedium in some of this work because you have to build some of the things to make sure the new systems and the new infrastructure can grow up organically to support that future state in a year, two, three, two or three or five years from now. Yeah, I mean, I love that part. We had talked about this too, the boredom part. I'd, there was a book I was listening to recently, Mastery, um, not the big, thick one. I can't remember the gentleman's name. It's a shorter one, but he was focusing on his experiences in Aikido, and it was, I'm just going to practice this punch, and I'm on this plateau, and this is what I'm going to do for the next year. And he's like, but it's in doing that that you get to that next level. Um, and it's interesting to take that in comparison to the organizations we work with, because you know it, it makes me think of two things. One is, if it's a three-year effort for some type of transformation, I, I hear a lot in the mission-driven space around me about change fatigue. Yeah. And then the other thing I always hear is, I need a quick win. What's my quick win? And so I wonder if you just have any thoughts on, on those two between, it, like we have said several times in this conversation, this is happening. The, the, yeah. the industries are shifting, right? There's, there's nothing we can do. We got to be able to adapt. So change is inevitable and, and own it or not. But change fatigue seems to be a thing people talk about mostly with system switching. And then, yeah, so I don't know if you got opinions on these. Uh, okay, and, then, sure. and then how do I get a quick win? Is the one thing <laughs> I do. To keep the momentum, right? Because it does get emotional. And yeah. How do you keep yourself engaged? Yeah, I think it's a great question, right? Because somehow in a, it's, a, it's a weird situation now where we're not always being told what to do. And that is a really important component of this. I hear from a lot of people, well, I need greater role, role clarity. And I need more direction for my leadership team. And trust me when I say, if they had it, they would give it to you. And right, I mean, that's, that's where we're at. And so when we talk about change fatigue, I think it's one, the, part of what I do is I had to figure out as a strategist how to go to the level of individuals. How do I help individuals who are in that while knowing we're still advancing the strategy? And there is some making peace with the fact that the change is inevitable. And so how can I be a part of it? I really do think foundationally that at an individual level, we all have to just be somewhat accepting that the change is coming. So whether we're fatigued or not, and I will say I talk to a lot of really exhausted people, is recognizing that it is exhausting. And it doesn't always alleviate it, but sometimes cognitively, I think it does help for us to go, oh, right. So a few deep breaths and to recognize that as fast as everything feels to be moving, there's still some weird relativity of time where on a day-to-day -day basis, it's moving at a <laughs> very myopically slow speed. So go into those moments and recognize that there's change fatigue that seems to be pummeling us. And then there's still moments where we can take a step back and, and breathe and kind of go, okay, how can I see this around me? So that's one piece. Now, when we're talking about the, uh, how do you keep momentum in all of this? I think it really is that idea of the integrator, right? So how do you have people who are thinking enough to say, where are we going to be in three years and to trust that the work is getting us there because it won't always feel like that. We have to keep moving things forward. And are we moving forward, even if it's tedious, even if the output doesn't feel super sexy. And this goes back to your point about the quick wins. And one of the things I've been on an individual basis when I work with people is I'm very quick to say there really aren't big wins and there really aren't quick wins anymore. Maybe there weren't 20, 30 years ago, but there, it really doesn't exist now where we have one spectacular big win and it makes a career. You're more likely to have a collaborative project 
that was cumbersome and clunky and messy and you delivered something fantastic that 200 people could put on their resume. So part of the making peace with some of this is in the role you're in, the wins might not come quickly. That's a really tough nut to swallow, right? Just take that in a little bit is there are really aren't quick wins in the role you're currently in. The work we're doing today, again, in big organizations, small organizations, not-for-profit, mission-driven, doesn't, doesn't matter, is we are now shepherding work on an individual basis in order to make things better over time. And so the work you're doing today is probably going to set you up better for the role one from now. <laughs> so a year from now or two years from now, both at an individual level and your organizations. So that makes performance reviews really tricky. It makes setting goals really tricky and it makes the quick wins really tricky because they really don't exist. And so there's something that you have to say, how do I manage what I'm doing professionally? How do I manage that within the context of this work? And then to trust that if you're a person, I meet plenty of very thoughtful people who are with very high integrity who say, I think I'm just going to focus on doing re this really great work and then telling a really great story so that you can get some traction with that. And so if there are failures, how do we learn from that? If you built something that's not sexy, how do you tie it back into an existing P&L and say, guess what? We're already using these three components of the new technology to support this existing piece of the business. That's the quickest route to gain, if, you know, in the traditional change management language, champions or sponsors. But tie it back to the existing business. Tie it back to how it benefits somebody who owns a P&L who is thinking, oh my gosh, I can't manage all this change and the quarterly pressure. So what we can do for each other is take some of that pressure off by saying we're going to build some things that will support the future as well as pull the existing business into the future by supporting it now. Yeah, I mean, I, so, yeah, so I have so many thoughts after everything you just said right there. Uh, you know, I've, I've expressed it to you, I've expressed it to other people, and it's, it's something that has, I think, has surrounded me for a long time, but it only really started dawning on me where it's... I think the annual budget cycles that happen, at least in the, the work I do with mission-driven sectors and the annual performance review planning mm -hmm. are hindering what I think is the potential for some of the progress that could be made even on an individual level. Because if I budget this year, because I've got the money this year to do everything I possibly can, I don't know where it's going to be next year. Um, you still have to do something in the next year. Yeah. And what if you can't get it all done this year? Oh, well, does it not flow over? So, you know, we find road mapping across the years and trying what we try to help groups is like, what's your cumulative approach to the work? And why yeah. do you want to get there? And how can you all decide what's a priority? And if you know you didn't get to it, it's okay because it's still there. But I think about this too, because, you know, burnout is real. And we see people who take on these change roles, uh, whether it's default and they meant to or not, you know, they... It's hard. I like what you were saying there. Like they're they're looking for role clarity. They're looking for something from the leader, and it to, it's hard for a leader to say, "Hey, let me really fix this for you, uh, or give you the, really a good clarity today," because they can't. Right to your point. But how do we, you know, how do we manage against that? How do we, you know, for me, it's always been, what lessons learned can you pull out of this? Mm -hmm. What are you gaining individually from this? Right, because it is messy and it is hard, but you're going to learn a lot of things you didn't intend to. I think in the old days they used to call them soft skills. Now they're calling it emotional <laughs> intelligence or right, right. EQ or IQ or I don't know what you're saying these days. But um, I still don't have any thoughts on that. Like we're, and I, you made the other point too. Maybe we should talk about this. Like what have what have you seen that is a sure sign for failure in these? Like how how would these things fail? But also, this is culture shifting and culture changing at the same time. And again, back to the tech language, I always hear we like to fail fast and Failure is acceptable, but then I've never seen any of these groups actually admit to a failure publicly or anywhere, or even document it to say, hey, we tried three approaches, two didn't work, this is why we went with one. If in the future you want to look back at our math and see why these two didn't work and you think you can make it work, great, but this is why we went. I, I never see this. And so I feel like that's almost this other downward pressure on these on staff that are trying to do this work, right? Where it's, I don't know how this is going to go. I probably am not going to get it right, but you want me to deliver this thing that's supposedly perfect. And this is a lot of emotional pressure on me. So I, I don't know if you have thoughts on how do you bring failure acceptance in and, and what are the, the warning signs? On well, we're going to fail. 
But I think that's one of the things we have to accept. It, we're just going to fail. And the question then becomes, can you not just learn from the failures, but can you almost use the failures as future work? So this is a, something I've used in the coaching I've done and with the teams I've led is to say sometimes what we're doing today does not feel like it's going to move the needle in that quick win. But we're, we're planting the seeds for future work where we can pick the work back up at a later time and it'll still be relevant and current. And that's a really strange muscle to build, but super helpful is you're going to fail because there are political wins. There are just human flaws and failings. And so we're going to bump into that every day. And so I think it's, whether we want to call it emotional intelligence or not, it's these things kind of pummel us. And we're, I meet a lot of people who are just exhausted because of that. So let's acknowledge we're going to fail. So let's focus on doing meaningful and actionable future work that we know is needed, whether anybody's telling us to do it or not. And I don't have to press teams, even relatively junior teams, I don't have to press them very hard to figure out what would actually move the needle. They know, and especially if you can get a meeting of the minds where you can get, say, five or eight people in a room to think about that for 90 minutes, with the right questions, that group will advance thinking. They, they will shift their baseline up so that curve starts to move in a more upward trajectory, even if it's still a loop or a, a, a spiral. So don't underestimate what you can do with kind of crowdsourcing. So one of the things I, I laugh and I tell people is, Look back, like Tom Sawyer was a genius. He got a bunch of people to do the work he didn't want to do. And so let's go back and borrow from some of that is you can actually bring people together and not a brainstorming session, but actually like, how are we going to materially move this and take some of the pressure off just those people who are on the hook for it. And especially in the middle layer, you can get a lot of clarity and you can advance a lot of thinking, even if it's wrong, even if it feels like a failure, because what it does is suddenly you've coalesced a lot of thinking and understanding. From the middle layer of organizations, then you can vet it with your senior level and they will tell you if it's wrong. But they can't tell you if your understanding is wrong if you're not at least willing to put something out there, if you're not at least willing to guess on strategic direction, if you're not at least willing to say, I think my role is ambiguous, but I'm pretty sure we need to go over here and do these three things and produce something. Right, they'll, they'll course correct, but right now everybody is so uncertain in the roles they're in. And so I think anything you can do to start advancing the thinking and coalescing thinking within the organizations you're in, the better. Um, let's talk a little bit about the distractions that you talked about, right? The things like performance reviews and the budget process and um, bonus, bonuses and things like that. These are all necessary and good things. And mature organizations, healthy, mature organizations do these things, but they're the last to catch up. So when we talk about the foundational systems, these systems that dictate budgets and how we spend money, the systems that dictate how we're going to evaluate and reward talent, which you can also just call people, right? Those are, are pretty stable systems. And so it's going to take quite a long time for them to catch up. Fundamentally, nothing really has shifted in these spaces for years and years and years. Even while the internet ha is now cycling through, but maybe it's fifth generation and we're heading into, we're using AI today and we may not even be aware of it, it's happening, where organizations are shifting from having all of their infrastructure on site to using the cloud. These things are happening while these other processes, budgets and procurement and HR systems, they're staying relatively stable. And they might be more efficient, but they're not yet disrupted. And so I think what we have to do is just look at them for what they are. And what I tell people is attach no self-esteem to your performance review, because at best, it's just a, a um, useful but incomplete process to evaluate and tell you what's going on with the people in the organization. At the most kind of cynical approach, it's just a way to distribute money on a bell curve, right? Like if you're doing bonuses, and so don't attach any self-worth in it, just use it, take it for what it is. And an organization that wasn't doing it would soon be figuring out that they had to do it. And so it's going to be imperfect. Budgets are going to be messy and imperfect. Performance evaluations and goal setting are going to be messy and imperfect. And so don't spend a lot of emotional energy on those things. 
even as you're doing them and doing them responsibly. So that's the best way I could say to navigate that is they're not going away and we would need something in their, in their place. So just take it with kind of a broad perspective. Oh yeah, I have to go do performance reviews and I'm going to spend two hours on it and not get emotionally upset about it. I'm just going to do what's good for my team or what's good for me and then keep going and do the meaningful and good work that will actually move things along both individually and at a team level and organization level. So how, I mean, try to spin a positive again, I guess, but like, I mean, it's messy, it's uncomfortable, but it could be fun, right? I mean, I, I think there's, there's so much upside to it. And I'm curious in your experience, where, have you seen organizations that were on a good path and then just stalled out because they were on that plateau and couldn't, they couldn't tell they were making the difference, you know, or like even the person, maybe the people working on it, like, oh man, if you'd have just stuck with it for like another, another year, you'd have been there. There, yeah, of course. I mean, you and I have both seen this happen, right? right? Because there's an incubation period that usually is the length of a project where we're building something new and then we're incubating it. And then there's a reorg and all that learning sort of gets pushed to the wayside. And again, this is why I'm saying do things that are future proof that somebody could pick up that body of work, no matter what happens within the organization. So I think it happens a lot because organizations first try to reorganize, reorganize people, moving people around an organizational chart. It's a natural thing to want to do, and sometimes it's necessary. But a lot of work and learning also gets pushed to the wayside. That's probably not going to change. But if you do the work in a way that says, I don't have to be on this team for two years, you do things in a really different asymmetrical way. If you know you're going, the cycle is there are reorganizations in the, in the organization after every, the end of every fiscal year, then do something where at the end of the fiscal year, you know you've actually moved something forward and can hand it over to somebody else or they can go back and look at it. So again, it's reframing how we think about these things because we're going to keep doing that work. Now, to your point, can it be fun? It's absolutely fun. And this is the push I get from people to say, well, if there are no quick wins, if there are no big wins. If it's so hard, why do it? And my answer is simple, because making new things is thrilling. And it may not always lead to the perfect performance review or the straight line curve, but you'll know you're onto something when you're part of making things. And teams that make things together, even if it's, there's some friction in there, they produce better outcomes, right? The data shows us that that happens. And so I think it's making peace with these things and then saying I'm doing it because the alternative is sitting idle and inertia is way worse than some cognitive disruption or some discomfort. So you had a quote about the, the friction or, or a number I thought, right? Oh, it was, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, what um, was that again? Yeah. So my coaching training was from the Neuro Leadership Institute and I was reading one of their blog posts in the last couple of months. And this was just fascinating to me because they were talking about, the phenomenon of groupthink. And so we all know that inclusion and collaboration are wonderful, but they can also produce flawed outcomes or imperfect outcomes because we get everybody thinking together in the same. And so the premise of the article was they took a group of people or multiple groups of people when in a survey and introduced quite a bit of friction into that. So they made sure that when they were interviewing people that there was a lot of friction among the teams, among the siloed thinking, and the teams that were having so much friction self-reported that they didn't think that they did very well, that their outcomes weren't good. And what the, the empiric da empirical data showed was that uh, most of the time, if not all of the time, the teams with friction outperformed the teams that had strong cohesion, but were more inclined to have groupthink. And so this idea that we should all be getting along and that how, how can we build more cohesion, it's really more of how do we have a safe spot in order to have that discomfort and that friction because we know from the data that it produces better outcomes. This was not encouraging data to a lot of the people that I work with because the moral of the story and the message is the friction is good and it produces far better outcomes. And this is also why I think savvy executives don't always intervene to fix things because they know that if they let the teams kind of storm and norm, then over time those outcomes will be better. And so even the temptation to reorganize 
is probably, a, there's probably some value just in the fact that you keep introducing the friction, that there's some healthy tension that's always there. But self-reported, the teams felt it was really not a great experience. And so I think the more we can just say there's something juicy that happens when we bring people with really strong viewpoints together. And then again, that role of the integrator can be strategic. It can be architectural, but it also can be as the coach. And that's, I think, why I am doing what I'm doing is so I can look at that from all these different layers and say, okay, now how do we help these teams so that they don't feel like they want to go home and just, you know, crawl into loungewear and go to bed in the middle of winter? How do we help it make it a more interesting and dynamic environment, even if it doesn't always feel great? I mean, I'd love that point because there was, um, you know, some work I've done in the past life, but I remember talking to, it was in a very hierarchical organization. And in that, whoever was the highest ranked person in the room would tend to just talk and everybody would be quiet and then they might leave later and then they might have an opinion or they might have yeah. wanted to do it different, but they didn't speak it. And then the person was sensitive who had been the leader, like, oh, I wish I'd heard that. And I said, well, we have to start creating the environments where we can make that happen, where people can feel comfortable in the room to disagree. And it was, I, I would always say, you know, disagreement doesn't equal disrespect. Like there is a way to do this. I almost feel like we have to like relearn the art of debate or something where. I think so. I, I always tell people like, what makes you most nervous? I'm like, I am so nervous when everybody just agrees yeah. right out of the box on something. Cause I just, I just don't, I don't think that's human nature. I don't think it's true. And I know I'm never the genius in the room, right. Who has it all figured out. So it's like, I know there's other smart people. Like, why aren't you coming in? I, I mean, I love that point. I, re I really think that's something to, to take forward. I mean, we should just be blasting on billboards. Like you, you, <laughs> right. really, you need the diversity of opinions. You need, you need disagreements. You need, you need to be challenged a little bit and then feel good about where you get to. Right. Yeah. Make sure and, all this, yeah. And celebrate that. So, and I want to make sure that we're, because when I started this company, you know, I had to really wrestle with what was I really going to focus on? Was I going to focus at the organizational level, these big, messy, hairy things, or was I going to focus at the level of the work? And so for me, I know those big, hairy, messy things are going to be out there. And there are very good resources and excellent coaches and consultants who focus in that space. But what happens sometimes is we're focusing there, we forget about shepherding the work forward that's also going to catch up. And so for me, I just acknowledge there's going to be a lot of friction in organizations. It's part of the deal. The organizations are going to have light and dark and they're going to have great strategy and terrible strategy and they're going to have messy emotions and people and it's okay right that's how I make peace with it and with the people I work with is just say you can't fix that it, somebody else might be working on it and you might not even know that they're working on it but let's focus at the level that you're at and see what you can do and at the individual level to bring teams closer together and I've done this at relatively junior levels in organizations and they love it because all of a sudden they come back from a meeting with their peers and this is not C-suite executives. It's not part of the executive leadership team. These are people who truly boots on the ground getting work done and figuring out how to collaborate every day. And with a few tools and a few things that orient them to say, well, why can't you have a better meeting with this group of peers? And they go, oh, I guess I could. And then they come back and they say, oh my gosh, that worked fantastically well. So again, it, we have to kind of empower ourselves and model the behavior at whatever level we're at in the organization and waiting for, again, that top down, tr you know, trickle down transformation, you're going to wait a long time. And so anything you can do just to say today, I'm going to show up a little bit differently. And again, that's a really different mindset for me because I was always thinking about big picture strategy and could push teams to get there. And it's just not super fun to be pushed. So how can we make it so it's a more, uh, if not enjoyable experience, a more growth oriented experience along the way. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I, I know we're, we're going to probably be running up on time. It's yeah. just for our audience in general. We've tried to get these down to questions, but it's, these conversations are so good. I, I think this is just the format of this long form conversation because it's, <laughs> sure. it's, it's too good. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting too. What I have found in my experience, at least up until now, is maybe as more groups start to grasp it, the fact that they're going to have to have these evolutionary changes and transformation, but it's, it seems I've always been the change agent or who was assigned to was someone who really didn't have authority. They didn't have a staff or a team or they were, but they're given these mandates. Right. And I, I like where you had said you focused on the work. That's, that's where I saw it in my career in the beginning. 
Whereas I would go into these organizations and I'd be the one who did this big website redesign, special project manager, right? And then you have to go and you have to talk about taxonomy or the org structure or why you're doing this with this department. And it was someone, um, a really wise academic, when I was interviewing her, one of these organizations I worked in, it told me, she's like, you're not building a website, you're shifting the culture of the organization and you're actually changing its perception to the world. She's like, that's why everybody is upset with you. <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay. Like the anthropologist in me then came out and was like, let me think about this in a different way. But I'm wondering, it, has that been your experience too? And you know, what do we do to make sure if you're that person, you feel supported for yourself and, and where to look? Yeah, well, I think your point is really good. And we've talked about this too. And I think there is a phenomenon that happens, especially because so much of this transformative work spans an entire organization. So we tend to invite all the senior stakeholders into the first conversations about the transform transformation or the transformative work. And we push it then into a reverse funnel where we have 10 executive leaders and one project manager who's not a peer of those executive leaders. So I just call it the upside down pyramid. And that's, a, that's not a super organizational structure. If you see that structure, the work will suffer. And so now that person, that doesn't let them off the hook because they've been given an assignment and it's their job today. And so let's talk practically what that person can do and then we'll go back up. So that person, again, put on that Tom Sawyer hat to say, how do I go build a co not just a coalition, but a team of helpers, right? A team of people who can help me shape the thinking. And maybe I'm not going to get to a, a completely redesigned website, but maybe I can bring it together so that we have a common architecture that we could take to those executive leaders. But one person can't do it by themselves. And so if you have that kind of reverse pyramid structure, what I tell people is go build friendships and partnerships and helpers, go and list helpers among people in those verticals and then bring them together to actually in 90 minute increments. It doesn't actually have to be any longer to say today we're going to decide what this looks like or we're going to frame all the multiple viewpoints that we have so we can share with our executive team. So one of the biggest skills I think that individual who kind of is trying to hold all of that together and those are really tough roles. I've been in them. I know you have how do we move that forward is you start to get good at building narratives and you have to build a narrative that goes up and out and they're not, sometimes they're the same, but they're not always the same. And so this is a skill I think that we have to start thinking of how do you build that skill? Because the traditional project management of empirically showing the progress against the plan doesn't seem to work anymore. There has to be some storytelling that goes with it. And so as competent as I know many project managers are, and I know some really excellent ones, the storytelling becomes really important just to say, how do we synthesize or integrate the story to say, guess what? We have 17 different definitions of this one thing. And then you, get, you wake executives up, right? Then they go, oh my gosh, how do we fix that? How do we help you fix that? Or we have these competing priorities. And if we reorient them, we've figured out how we can move some things forward, right? Those are the stories you need to be able to start telling. So anything you can do to get better at enlisting help in short and framing short increment deliverables to say we're going to go create something and advance the knowledge base and the thinking of the organization and last but definitely not least how to frame back a narrative that helps you to manage the whole thing all right i mean this has been an awesome conversation i okay. i could probably keep going for quite a while but uh we're, the time, we're, right? we're coming up on an hour yeah. so uh what are you got any last thoughts that you might want to speak to the eyes and maybe we can we could do this again or uh well you know i love talking with you tony so i think yeah. it, one it's just keep the conversation going and know that work is really hard there's a reason why i'm doing what i'm doing is that it just is really hard i hear it from everybody and they're so relieved when we say it and you've talked about this too acknowledge that we're in the middle of a fundamental shift and not only how we work but what work is going to look like the truth is what's shifting under us with technology and with these organizations shifting how their sectors work is we don't know what 10 years from now is even going to look like. And so I think we're feeling those effects. And the more we're just talking about that and then finding ways to do good work, that starts to make people feel a little bit more like, oh, I can handle this. I can manage this, even if there's not necessarily a clear roadmap. Yeah, I love it. I mean, yeah, we say it too, right? We talk to so many clients who are like, oh, we must be the worst. I'm like, no, everyone has these problems. Like, you're not alone. It, it, it just appears, it's, a, it's that social media phenomenon. Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. 
And yeah. it's like, no, everyone's, everybody's struggling because to your point, this is, this is an interesting time. Technology yeah. is, is everywhere. These, these roles are changing. What should you even study? Return to the generalist. Um, well, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate you uh, coming on here with me today and having this conversation. Um, so again, Carolyn Slayers, uh, Murphy Merton, murphymerton.com. You got it. Uh, look her up on LinkedIn, hit that website. Uh, and if you really liked what you heard today, give us some comments. You know, we'd love some feedback and see if this is helpful. And hopefully we could bring back another conversation about uh, transformation and change again. And so thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Tony. I really appreciate it. Excellent.